Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is George Carey, and um, <clears throat> work for uh, Fluid Industrial Associates, FIA. And we're about to uh, present a, uh, a Zoom class on troubleshooting low pressure steam heating systems. Got a lot to cover. What I'm going to do, like we do in all of our classes, is I'm going to mute everybody. There's a chat uh, featured at the bottom of the page that you can type in a question. Rob Ellis, a colleague of mine from FIA, is going to be monitoring the chat room. So fire away your questions. We'll do our best to answer them. And if they still linger at the end, I'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll unmute everybody. You can ask a question if they still have something. We've got a lot to cover, so it's going to it's going to be probably at least a full hour, and uh, I'll go through it uh, thoroughly, but quickly as I can. And so without any further ado, just to get everything covered within the, uh, the time frame that we planned, I'm going to mute everybody and start the presentation. <clears throat> so troubleshooting steam. <clears throat> um, there's so much to talk about and so much to cover in a short period of time, but <clears throat> steam systems obviously characteristically, they've been around for a long time, you know, over a hundred years in some instances. Um, and um, you typically today, no one's gonna be putting in obviously a new steam system, but you are still gonna be wrestling with the remnants of, um, it could be a, uh, replacing a boiler that seems probably seems to be probably one of the most common reasons why you touch a steam steam system is is the boiler fails and now you got to go in and replace it. And we'll talk a little bit about that because that can be a landmine um, if if you don't you know dot your eyes and cross your t's. One of the other challenging things that you, that that the contractor faces today is <clears throat> that's a steam boiler. That's an original coal fired converted maybe to oil and eventually to a gas burner or oil to gas conversion burner. But it's massive and it's designed for one thing to make low pressure steam. The near boiler piping on this old guy is not very elaborate. Out, <laughs> out and out to the system. Um, and, and what happens is when these boilers fail and, and the trade is, is challenged with trying to replace it, there's a lot that goes into it and, and how to establish what that new boiler needs to, or need, what size it needs to be and what it needs to look like. Over to the right hand here, here's a replacement, you know, modern boiler, if you will, which for the most part, some manufacturers are a little different, but for the most part, these modern boilers are hydronic boilers that are masquerading as steam boilers. But the other thing is this is piped absolutely out of the don't section of an installation manual. You won't find anything that's going on here in that manual. And that could just lead to a system that, you know, uh, uh, can provide a world of hurt <laughs> and aggravation in the process. So there's a lot of kind of uh, do's and don'ts, and, and maybe that's part of what this little presentation is all about, is what to do and what not to do and why. So when you're jumping into steam, <clears throat> if you get the opportunity to, to either try to troubleshoot a problem or put in a new steam boiler or what have you, a couple of thoughts. Uh, forget what you know about hot water systems. Steam is a gas that plays by its own rules. Steam is dynamic, moves very fast, and wants to condense into water. <clears throat> Think in terms of the system. And, and I, I usually try to say that in a lot of different applications, be it hydronic or, or what have you, controls. But steam is absolutely, uh, think in terms of system, not just the systems. Don't solve the problem before it is actually defined. The problem and the cause of the problem are really in the same space. You want to wander, one throughout the house, throughout the church, throughout the apartment building, whatever it is. Uh, as Dan Hollihan would say, take your boiler room blinders off and go, go, go wander around the place. And if you were trying to narrow it down into the top two or three things uh, that can create or lead to problems in a steam system, air, piping, and dirt, those are the usual suspects. Right off the bat, <clears throat> when you um, you start talking steam, um, it, it, the, the volumetric change is, is massive when you take a certain amount of water, uh, in this case here, say you take a pound of water and you provide enough energy, both latent and then more importantly, excuse me, sensible, and then more importantly, latent heat, uh, and you change its 
phase or its state from water to this gas, the steam, there's like a 1700 volume increase uh, of what that volume of one pound of water took up versus this one pound of steam. Um, and that's why steam doesn't need any help. It's its own motive force as far as expanding out into the system, condensing it when it touches something colder than it and shrinking back in volume and encouraging more steam to continue to flow. Um, just real quickly, I'm not gonna try to bore you to death with this chart, but it, it does reveal a couple of different things and, and it can open your eyes a little bit. But <clears throat> one of the things that, that I've bumped up over the years is when a guy's experiencing a problem with, you know, maybe some radiator or radiators, a section of a house or, or, or a school or a church or wherever uh, is not heating, not heating properly. Uh, their instincts are sometimes to take that pressure troll and turn it up, increase the pressure. And, and probably thinking like a feed valve and or just a larger circulator in the hydronic system. But what I want to point out over here is the volume of the steam in cubic feet relative to the pressure. And what happens is as you continue to increase the pressure, you reduce the volume of that one pound of steam or that volume of steam in that system. And when you're talking a steam system, well, obviously the piping is already existing. It's already there. And so when you reduce the volume of the, the volume that the gas takes up, you actually slow the steam down. You're not speeding it up by any stretch. You're actually slowing it down. So low pressure steam in a properly designed system, which we're going to have to make the assumption that you know 99% of them are because they would have been having problems 100 years ago. Uh, when you raise the pressure trying to solve a problem, you're actually slowing the distribution of steam in that system. The other thing, just one quick other note, is temperature in Fahrenheit. Zero pounds, 212, two pounds, 219, five pounds, 227. Steam heating, low pressure steam heating has nothing to do or very, very little to do with temperature. It has everything to do with this column right here. This is the black magic, latent heat and steam. 970, 966, 960. As you increase the pressure, which increases the temperature, you're actually lowering the value of the latent heat. And that's what a steam, a low pressure steam heating, heating system is designed around, latent heat. The, the, the giving off, the changing of state back from, from that water to a gas, go out into the system, fill in the piping, and more importantly, fill in the radiation, condense back to that water, that condensate, give off all of this latent heat in this column here. That's what's doing the heating in a low pressure steam heating system. So <clears throat> real quickly, what is a BTU? If you're taking some of the other classes, we've talked about it you know, in the past, but what is a BTU? A British thermal unit. The amount of energy required to raise one pound of 62 degree water all the way up to 63 degree water. Uh, just a side note, we've been doing some pool heating classes over the last couple of weeks, and this reference you know, ties in very, very well with establishing uh, size of pool heaters based on volume, the pound of water, uh, how many gallons and convert it to pounds and what your temperature rise. So it, it's, it's been around a long time. We live and, live and die by that expression, BTUs. Where did it come from? Where did this term come from? Well, it came in the early 1800s from a gentleman named Thomas Treadgold, and he basically wrote the first book on heating systems. He designed the heating and ventilation system in the House of Commons over in London, you know, a couple hundred years ago. So he also developed the second term that we use in steam all the time, and it's referred to as um, square foot of steam. What is a square foot of steam? And a square foot of steam basically was the surface area of one of James Watt's original radiators that would emit. And here's the key to why, when I saw, mentioned it earlier about that chart, that graph or the chart, I should say, on pressure, temperature, volume. A definition of a square foot of steam is 240 BTUs an hour when the room temperature was 70 degrees and the steam temperature is 215. Every radiator here in New England in the Northeast was sized to achieve that. <clears throat> Maintain the space at 70, transfer, emit 240 BTUs when the steam temperature inside the radiator was 215 degrees. So if you, if you remember from this chart, the properties chart, zero is 212, two pounds is 219. 
one pound is 260. Every radiator in this area was sized uh, for very low, no more than a pound of pressure. And then some vapor vacuum systems, maybe even less than that, ounces. Pressure is not what you need. Pressure is there for overcoming the resistance, the frictional resistance of the steam flowing through the pipes. That was taken care of that was taken care of by the installing contractor 100 years ago, 75 years ago, when he would size the pipe based on a one ounce pressure drop for every 100 feet of pipe. And if he got really crazy on a two pipe system, it might be two ounces of pressure drop for every 100 feet of pipe. For any of you that are on the line today that might have taken one of our system size classes earlier, you know, we talk about that, the friction resistance in a hydronic system. Well, the gas was encountering the same thing as it would rub against the wall of the piping being, as it was being delivered um, uh, out to the radiation, out to the radiators. Uh, and so they accounted for that. They said, look, let's size the pipe a little bigger, keep the pressure drop low. We can run the boilers very, very uh, low in, in pressure by design. Uh, and here is a picture of one of those uh, panel or uh, gold mattress radiators, a guy from Connecticut. Cornwall, Connecticut, Stephen Gold. He invented the first boiler and the first radiator that was sold into a residential home. And this was a picture of a home in upstate New York where they actually had them still installed and they were, and they were operating. So it's, it's a couple hundred years, a uh, hundred and something years old, probably 120 years or so. So here's the, uh, here the expression, the equivalent direct radiation. Direct radiation where the radiation sits directly in the space where the people are. That, uh, that's referred to as direct radiation. And then they would size it and say, okay, the heat loss of this room uh, is X number of BTUs divided by 240. Okay, I got to buy a radiator that has so many square feet of EDR, equivalent direct radiation, to offset the heat loss to keep the room at 70 with a steam temperature of 215 degrees. So some more traditional uh, column radiators, you know, that, that's, a, that's pretty classic. That's, that's a pretty common radiator. We don't have enough time to go into all the, the story of radiators and radiation, but just some pictures of a couple, couple of common stuff, typically on a one pipe. They got some, some of the systems became kind of ornate where they get pretty fancy and they'd have a stairway radiator and they'd build a radiator on site to match the height of the stairs. Another thing I just want to touch base on is this, instead of a direct radiation, uh, I don't know if you've come across the expression, an indirect radiation. What is indirect radiation? Within the industry, the trade, a lot of times we refer to this as pin radiation because it looked like pins on little cast iron boiler section pulled together. And, and that's kind of that's where the expression came from, the pin radiation, is it looked just like that. <clears throat> If you've ever been in a system or a home that had that, you'd be downstairs in the basement and you'd see all this ductwork. And what's going on is the ductwork, it has, it has these boxes where the radiation resides and they actually were taking fresh outside air and directing it across the, the bottom of that indirect radiation. The steam would condense across the colder air as it flew through the pins and then warm air would rise up into the living space. So when you first walked into the house on the first floor, you'd say, oh, I got a gravity warm air. Well, it was a steam system, but it was kind of a combo. It did use air, buoyancy of air, uh, to deliver the BTUs, but its source was not hydronics. It was a steam system with indirect radiators. So then the question might be asked, you know, well, why, why would they do that? Why, why go through all those pains and putting in duct work and running registers and, and all of that, not just leave it down in the basement. I mean, excuse me, leave the radiators in the space, the direct radiation. Well, here we are, 102 years ago, the Spanish influenza in 1918. And the reason I show this picture, which is it's really, it's, it's blowing my mind what, what the world is going through right now, but I showed these pictures over the years when I do this class because people were wearing masks. And here's a picture of, uh, I think it was a Navy ship, the USS Siboney, boxing match between a couple of sailors, perhaps. And a lot of the sailors in the audience all have face masks on. Face masks, masks on. And I would always say comment to the people in the, in the audience when I'm doing a presentation, you know, can you imagine that? Can you imagine walking around with a face mask on? And here we are 102 years later, and, and we're going through this pandemic. It's just, it's, uh, it's just crazy. 
but uh, unrelated, they, um, the, the heating engineers at the time kind of speculated that um, as these new centrally installed heating systems were using the same air over and over again within the house, they come up with an expression that, that maybe they had created vitiated air, you know, like almost like dead air. And maybe that was attributing to this pandemic, to this, to this you know, high number of deaths. So the heating engineer said, look, let's come up with a system where we can take outside air and, uh, and bring in a, a constant supply of fresh air, heat it up through this indirect, through the registers on the floor or in the low part of the ceiling. And the way the houses were and buildings were constructed back then, they had a lot of leakage, so they had no problem exfiltrating. So you had this constant supply of fresh air flowing in, getting heating up, heated up, warm in the rooms, and then exfiltrate through the windows or the, the, the roof, the attic, and, and you know, and it just constantly replenish itself. <clears throat> um, just a quick, a quick side view, you'd have cold air entering here, moving across the pins, warm air now being lighter, buoyant, floating up through through the ductwork and up into the, um, to, to discharge into the register into the space. That was just an example of a system I found out in Eastern Point up in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Would have been originally probably a, a home of a, of a captain of a ship or a, a fishing vessel or what have you. And so back then this system, these types of systems were, they were the Cadillacs. They, you couldn't get a better system back then. And uh, so they're just showing this uh, contractor actually gave directions probably to the caretaker of the property on how to reposition these pulleys, these handles, one of the handles is missing, but he gave them directions and it would influence this damper as to how much makeup air versus how much return air would be distributed throughout the house. So moving on, uh, steam, that, that part about you taking a pound of water and you give it enough latent heat and it flashes and expands, 1700 plus times. Conversely, you remove that latent heat and steam condenses and a vacuum is formed. So it's, it's not a bad thing, it's just mother nature doing her thing. And you just wanna be aware of it because sometimes vacuums can cause some you know, heartache or headache. But, uh, but anyway, so just recognize that the water expands a tremendous volume and then when it loses its latent heat, it shrinks a tremendous volume. When you're in systems where you don't really want that to be an issue, uh, one quick thing to use, and we suggest it on all, you know, especially commercial boilers and commercial systems, anywhere where there's zone valves, you know, big Honeywell zone valves or Barbara Coleman or whoever, uh, always use vacuum breakers. And the vacuum breaker, what you'll notice, I show this inside here, is you got a spring tension with this set screw. And it's an adjustable. And I always tell the guys, when you're doing it, we don't want any vacuum at all. When the system's making steam and you run the boiler at a pound, a couple of pounds, whatever, take this nut and loosen it so you're almost pissing steam out the, out the, out the vacuum brake and now you've got the least amount of tension. So any form of vacuum starts to form, the spring is gonna pull in and break the vacuum and it's almost like taking your finger off the straw, releasing it. So real quickly, different types of steam systems we'll kind of talk a little bit about. One pipe steam, um, this is showing a one pipe dry return. Uh, two quick comments, one pipe, meaning how many pipes feed the radiation? That's the, that's the quickest way to, to delineate between a one pipe and a two pipe. What they're referring to is not the mains and the, and the returns and all that, it's the, it's the line, the riser feeding the radiator. If you only have one, you have a one pipe steam. And then the other part could be, this might be referred to as a one pipe dry return steam system. And what we're referring to here is this line here. Even though technically you could say, where did the break take place? It's still a steam supply. It's just a play on words. After the last takeoff, then they might start referring to the remaining piping as it's the, it's the, it's the part of the return side of the system. And a quick way to say, hey, I'm a dry return. When the boiler's off, what's in the pipe? If it's just air, that's known as a dry return versus a one pipe wet return same thing one pipe feeding the radiators <clears throat> but now i'm coming back maybe i drop my main at the end of the building drop it down below the boiler's water line and here's my wet return coming back to the boiler room again another way to differentiate is to say okay when the boiler is off what's in the pipe if it's always filled with water it's a wet return 
so just the difference between dry and wet. <clears throat> Uh, you're getting into a little more elaborate, a little more built up system. It's a one pipe, maybe with uh, three stories. One comment just to make, we're just noticing stuff like this. This supply main here, it takes off and it actually drops down. You say, how can the steam go down to feed risers, to feed radiators that are upstairs on these second, third floors? Steam doesn't know up or down, it just knows out. Wherever the vents are, wherever low pressure is, that's what that gas is chasing. The other benefit from an engineering standpoint was all of the radiation, all of the condensate that's gonna be formed by this radiation is now not draining back onto the main. It has its own drip leg. So the quality and the integrity of the residual steam, remaining steam, is not impacted. You have this one radiator, yeah, his return is dumping back onto that one pipe but then all of this radiation is now seeing its own drip leg back to the wet return. And then one last type that you might see in a one pipe system is referred to as counter flow. And all that means is it's the steam flow is in one direction chasing the main vent and all of the condensate that is formed on these individual radiators is draining back counter flow to the direction of steam. It's a very finicky system, very, very difficult to manage. Here's a quick example of a, a, we're in Brookline, Massachusetts, in an apartment building where the basement gets converted to, uh, to be used for heating. But the, because of the boiler's water line, they couldn't put the radiators down on the floor. So at the end of the main, they, as they're dropping down to get into their wet return, they cut in a T, have a supply, mount a radiator, wall brackets, you got a one pipe steam system, one pipe steam radiator in a lower unit floor, a lower floor unit uh, mounted high up on the wall to be so that it's well above the boiler's water line. Just a classic, you know, standard picture of a one pipe. Here's our one pipe valve. Whoop. Here's our one pipe radiator valve. Um, always want to have this valve one hundred percent open. Um, if you had to close it, then close it all the way. But yeah, ideally not because there's just there's, there's such a velocity uh, situation taking place here. You start to throttle that valve thinking you're gonna reduce the output of the boiler, uh, the uh, radiators, and you're gonna increase the velocity, which is gonna just drive any condensate that's forming here. It's gonna be driven by the steam right up this vent and onto the floor. So air as a, as a general, we started saying at the beginning, uh, air, pipe, piping, and dirt. So a couple, we'll look at a couple of different sources of where air can be a problem, how it can lead to no heat, uneven heat, short cycling of a boiler, some pretty common things that you'll bump up against in a steam system. So again, I mentioned it earlier, the first one pipe steam system, they had no steam vents. They didn't know about them because it was all brand new. And so when they were starting to run the system, they had to add these air pipes that are located on the backside of these um, mattress, Stephen Gold mattress radiators, and then connect it to the second floor uh, mattress and then out through the roof. And then as they fed the, the main that was going past each radiator, they had a pet cock. And when they fired that coal fired boiler and they wanted heat, they would go and they would manually open the pet cocks. And then hopefully remember once the room warmed up to close the pet cock so that you just didn't have steam flowing through up the the air pipe and out the roof. That'd just be a waste of you know, water and energy. But it was very primitive. But again, 200 years ago, not 200, excuse me, 120, 130 years ago, that, that, was, that was better than a fireplace. Uh, and one of the issues they had once they started realizing, hey, we gotta provide vents because we gotta get rid of the air. We gotta displace the air. If, if where there's air, there will not be steam. We gotta remove it. And it was just a challenge coming up with a different technology. This was almost like a bi uh, carbon type material that would react to a change in temperature. And so if you follow the path, here's the arrow, arrow here, and the air would be able to pass through, through this opening here and down through the outlet. And that's how the air got out of that radiator or that indirect radiation. And then when the steam started to arrive and that temperature changed, that would re, like reposition itself, would flex the other way and drive that plug into the hole. Now there's no passageway for the steam to get out. So they experimented with bimetal, with carbonate. Um, 
materials, anything that could uh, react to a change in temperature. Get rid of the air and then stop the steam. And here's just a picture of a bank of indirect radiators that was using, I, I have this vent actually uh, back in my office in the education room at FIA. And it's, you know, look at the date. It's, Christ, it's 140 years old. And, and that's what they were using back then. So with the, some of the manufacturers, you know, and this is again in its infancy, were saying, hey, we need a vent. It needs to do three things. Vent air from the mains, so that'd be a main vent. Vent air from the radiators, a different, a different radiator vent. Closed in the presence of steam. And if for some reason there was an unusual amount of water there, lift that float and close. And then when the steam condensed to uh, reopen uh, automatically. Uh, to vent any residual remaining air and as well as break any vacuum. And the first one that was able to do it was a guy in, uh, again, down in um, uh, Waterbury, Connecticut, George Hoffman. It was an actual Hoffman that started the company Hoffman, you know, that we represent and have, you know, for years. But it was 1913. And he was the first one that was able to build the vent that met all three criteria. Normally open to vent air in the presence of water, this float would rise up. In the presence of steam, the, uh, there's a little diaphragm down here that's filled with alcohol and water under a vacuum. And as that temperature increased, that little dab, the little drop of water and alcohol would flash. And as it flashed, that base right there wasn't movable. So that pin would be driven up into its um, opening and snap shut. You could hear it click. And then when the steam condensed in the radiator started to cool down, same flashing of the water and alcohol in here would cool down and it would almost like collapse like a, an accordion and pull that pin away from the, the opening. So it was an automatic air vent and it was one of the first ones that you know was successful. So again, just a color drawing, that's when the vents normally open. The idea being when it's, when it's starting to see steam and what they want, the reason they added the uh, alcohol is alcohol has a lowering boiling point than just plain water. And they didn't want to wait until the steam finally got here because you could have some steam get past it and get out. So they wanted it to boil as the steam was still inside the radiator before it got to the vent. Uh, just real quickly, a couple of facts about radiator vents that doesn't necessarily talked about all the time, but it can help or hurt you pretty quickly. Uh, um, <clears throat> they're showing two pressure ratings on each vent. One of them is the operating pressure and one of them is the maximum pressure. Maximum pressure, in this case here, they're saying 10 PSI. That has to do with the temperature of the steam, 330, 239 material or construction. But the other one, which is a kind of a subtle setting, which is also the most important setting or, or rating, has to do with operating pressure. And what I mean by that is this. Operating pressure can also be called drop away pressure. Crank the pressure troll down. So if you looked at a steam system and how it operates, this, the pressure within a steam system, it's almost like a sine wave. And when the system's off, it's at atmospheric pressure zero. And then you turn a boiler on. And depending upon your settings on your pressure troll, you, are, you operate between a high and then down to a minimum, a low, a low limit, kick it back on and you just cycle as long as there's a call for heat. Well, what, what I was saying back here with this rating, this manufacturer, Hoffman's, radiate adjustable radio vent has an operating pressure of one and a half psi what it's saying here is every time the system gets above one and a half psi and the steam makes its way to that vent and the vent closes it makes its way to the radiator eventually to the vent the vent closes when that steam inside that radiator condenses <clears throat> if the pressure is above one and a half psi that vent, the weight of that vent doesn't have enough weight to fall down, to drop away, and it remains closed. So here's just kind of a cutaway drawing uh, showing steam entering into a radiator, the air being vented out through the vent, steam, the properties of the steam are, it's lighter than air, so a lot of times it kind of enters, starts to work its way in, and then kind of floats to the top. It works its way over to this vent, and then the vent is gonna snap shut. So on the first pass or first couple of passes, not all the air is out of that radiator. The problem is this, the residual air that was left over will expand filling that radiator. They'll just have a little bit of steam here, but the steam can't get in because the float can't drop back down because the pressure in that system is keeping that float from falling down, from dropping away. 
So you always want to be aware, and that's another just another reason, general point of, of interest, any one pipe steam system, keep the pressure low, it's going to improve the venting capabilities of your vent on every cycle. Um, I don't know that we're going to have a lot of time to, to go through this, but I don't know if you've ever been asked or, or for you, if you have ever asked someone, how do you set a pressure drop? What, what should the numbers be? And there is an actual methodology, and um, uh, it has to do with this. <clears throat> it's based on uh, the total BTU, or back then, the total EDR of the system. The pipes would have been selected, and one pipe steam would have been selected on a one ounce pressure drop per 100 feet. They're saying, okay, how big's the system? And then when you figure out how big the system is, you want to account for this frictional resistance of T's, valves, radiator valves, et cetera. So the way they would handle that is they say, okay, what's the longest run? Double it. That will account for the piping and the valves and fittings. What you want to do is set the cut in to, to cut in pressure to two times the system's pressure drop, and then the cut out or the differential, which is typically how it's listed, should be set to one. So we'll just go through a real quick example. Got a system, the radiators are all 50 square feet. I, uh, I check and I say, okay, uh, the, based on my connected load, my pipe is in fact has been connected, uh, uh, selected based on the connected radiation. So I know I'm working in this one ounce per 100 feet of pipe. <clears throat> Furthest run, double it. <clears throat> Now I'm gonna take my pressure troll. I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna set the cut in for two times, and I'm gonna set the cut out or differential, set it for the number one PSI. And what happens here, you get this uh, screw right here with the spring tension, that's gonna allow you to adjust the cut in pressure. And then you're gonna take the cover off, and you're gonna look and you see this little line here that says diff, that's your differential, and it's usually a white plastic wheel. And you'd say, Cut in equals cut out plus differential. So that's what we're referring to. <clears throat> and here's the key. We, we mentioned it earlier. Just remember this. If there's nothing else you take away from this, EDR, which is how the radiators showed up in the space, is based on 240 BTUs an hour per square foot rating. When the room is 70 and the steam temperature is 215, and steam tables show that steam at one PSI is 216. And some of these charts that I'm showing you, they're gonna be in an engineering book that's gonna be part of the packet that I email you guys after this is all done. <clears throat> so just run real quick, we'll run through this. Um, I got a boiler, furthest radiator is 200 feet, I double it, 400 feet. That's a good size system. Pipe sizing is based on a one ounce pressure drop. So one ounce for 400 feet would be four ounces, times it by two, eight ounces. That's my half pound setting. Cutout setting is eight ounces plus the one or a half, so one and a half PSI. So <clears throat> cut in at a half, differential at one and a half, uh, excuse me, at one. So I hit my maximum pressure in the system is no more than one and a half PSI. And that would be more than adequate for 99% of the steam systems all around the world. Quick comment on adjustable vents. They're very, very popular residentially maybe even to some extent in apartment buildings, but definitely residences. Why were they developed? You know, what, what was the reasoning to vent, uh, have an adjustment on the uh, venting, the air venting rate of each vent, each vent on a radiator? There was a gentleman that had a family or uh, a series of books, Odell. He wrote uh, technical training for the trade on all kinds of subjects, electricity, even got into refrigeration, um, he got into steam. And I found in one of his books, and then here he's talking about this. If I have two different size radiators with the same non-adjustable venting rate over the same amount of runtime of a heating application, <clears throat> this, is, this is what's going to happen. I am going to have the same amount of air displaced out of two different size radiators. So one radiator is going to be given off 50% of its heating capacity in that one space while the larger radiator is giving up one quarter of its BTU capacity. So you're gonna have uneven heating just because I have unadjusted, uh, non-adjustable um, air release cap, uh, uh, capacity with different size radiators. That's why they were invented. So we said here on this larger one, 
you want to get all that air out of there so you can get the heat out of here, make sure that guy's wide open. And on the smaller one, maybe you have it only half open. So over that same heating time frame, you've got even output throughout the house or the apartment. So what about short cycling? <clears throat> What happens, what can happen is if you notice in this one pipe steam system, very, very basic drawing, there's no steam vent. And that's not uncommon, unfortunately. And either it was there and it disappeared or uh, it got damaged and they plugged it. And then no more spitting of steam or condensate on the floor. But what can happen is steam is manufactured. It expands at 16, 1700 times and it starts pushing. And the air, which is another gas, can get compressed. So it does compress back <laughs> sorry it does compress back and then again being a gas it can compress the other way it, it says hey you know i'm going to push back on you and what's sitting back here sensing that increasing pressure but our pressure troll and so the pressure troll jumps in pressure boom shuts the burner off the steam that got onto the system condenses drops in pressure uh turns the burner back on and next thing you know it gets short cycle main vents will improve Two things, balance and preventing short cycling in a, uh, uh, well, almost in any system, but specifically in, in a uh, one pipe steam system. And again, out of Odell's, he's saying here, if I got this ridiculous, ridiculously small capacity main vent on a long main, this is what's gonna happen, imbalance. Wicked hot overheating, first couple of rises, air still hasn't been displaced yet, no heat, full of air on the far reaching radiators. This happens all the time, all over downtown Boston, all over downtown uh, Brookline, Cambridge, um, a, a, anywhere, Providence, Rhode Island, up in Portland, Maine, wherever the old cities are and they have steam systems. When they're not taken care of, there's no TLC. Um, they create all of these problems. <clears throat> He's talking back, you know, 60 years ago, he said, look, you wanna have the largest, highest capacity vent to unload all of the air in that main so that when that boiler comes on, he starts manufacturing steam. Steam is at that first riser and very, very shortly at that second or last riser. So you introduce balance to the system. And then they go on to say, look, at, if you're gonna make the investment, don't do this. Don't put it at the end of the main. They wanna protect that investment of that higher capacity main vent. And the reason is this, when you first start the system up, the mains are cold, the whole system's cold relative to steam. So on startup, you're making uh, more condensate than you would once you're in the running loop, once you've warmed up. But on startup, you've got a lot of water that's flying down the main with the steam that's chasing after this vent that's open to atmosphere. And so that velocity slams into the back of that T and it can damage the vent. They said, don't do that. And yet when you're out in the field, you see it all over the place. Two things, low, low capacity and right at the end of a main on a T. Again, guys will send me pitches and you just see it all over the place. <clears throat> Here was the, here's what they said. Look at when you're gonna put a main vent in on a steam system, get it back from the end of the main, 10, 12 inches, maybe 15, get it up on a nipple. All you're doing is protecting it. If there's any kind of startup banging with some condensate hitting this elbow, it's not gonna damage the diaphragm here in this vent. Um, and here I get a kick out of this. Uh, a gentleman you know, gives it a, a, a for effort, gets it up on a nipple, which is a good thing. But you had this pipe right here, you could have taken advantage of that perhaps and got it back from the elbow and up on the nipple. In two pipe steam, when you go to a two pipe system, how is the air handled? Well, when they first started it, they actually made what they called a two pipe air vent system. And we found these that they still exist all over downtown Boston. So you have a supply valve on one side and a return valve on the other. So the, at this time, steam traps weren't invented. And so they still had to displace the air, so they had an air vent system, uh, excuse me, an air vent used on the uh, outlet side of the radiator. And here's just kind of a quick drawing of it. And it was a nightmare of a system, and still is. Because what they didn't think about, the heating engineers when they first designed it, was when the steam gets into the radiator, and it's condensing and the radiator is starting to warm up, there's gonna be less condensing. And at some point steam might get out into the returns where it can wreak havoc with other radiators and it would. The reason they even thought of saying, hey, let's move from one pipe to two pipe was you had this <clears throat> velocity in that one pipe riser. 
as the radiators got bigger, meaning the BTU load got bigger, which means the amount of condensate got greater, there was a very difficult challenge of getting the wind, which was steam, chasing the vent, and the condensate that was forming draining back under that same set of conditions. So they theorized, hey, if we put a second pipe over here and create a return system, we'll take away this velocity concern. And they were right. And so that's what they come up with, this. But it was a nightmare. So the next step that they did was, again, another two-pipe air vent system, but a very subtle change, and it solved the problem. But it was very economically challenging was this. They'd have a riser come up, feed a riser, feed individual takeoffs, feed the radiators, have a separate supply, a return valve, have the vent on the return side of the radiator, but then they would run the return all the way down to the basement into the wet return. And what would happen is the water line was all the way across the basement. There was your seal, there was your trap. You didn't have any steam passing into the returns because they couldn't get past the water seal of all the other return lines down here that were filled with water all the time. So I solved it, but it was very expensive. I'm gonna move past this, it was just an old system. Sometimes you come across two pipe steam systems and they have no air vents on the radiators and it appears that they have no traps. That's not possible, they had to have something. And they, again, they were experimenting in the beginning. So that guy would take a picture of this radiator and he would send it to me and say, look at, I'm out replacing a steam boiler and I got a two pipe steam system. I'm like, okay, you get traps? No, no traps. I said, okay, so it was a two pipe with an air vent. And they go, nope, there's no air vents. I'm like, that's impossible. He sends me a picture. There it is. I'm like, so we do a little research, do a little digging. And what happens is you start scraping the paint off and all of a sudden you start seeing uh, names. We do a little digging. <clears throat> this is what they had. They had, no, uh, in this case here, it was a Richardson Paul system. And um, it's a three in one. And inside the radiator, they had this dip tube. From the outside, it looked just like a union elbow. But they had this little contraption with a little pinhole, was, which was acting like an air vent. They had this dip, seat, dip tube below the water seal at the base of the radiator column so that steam couldn't get out. That's what they would use, these very subtle systems. Finally, steam traps came to be. They used the same concept, that diaphragm, with alcohol and water. And the first company that introduced the steam trap to the market was uh, the train company. The train company is very famous for, you know, air conditioning, chillers, rooftops. They were a big player in the steam industry. And so you'd have a supply valve. You wouldn't have a vent on the radiator because the steam trap acted like that vent, as well as prevent the steam from getting past its point of use. Here's a more traditional two pipe steam you might see in a school or a church or an apartment building where each radiator has a supply valve, has its own trap, a common dry return, and it's okay because steam can't get into these returns because of the trap, but the air can. The air follows the return line all the way down. In this case here, we're now introduced a new device, a vented receiver, condensate pump, with the vent open to the atmosphere. That right here, this vent became the system's air vent. So just a cutaway of a thermostatic trap, a radiator trap, that bellows full of alcohol and water is almost like an accordion and it's collapsed. So it's pulled this ball or this plug off its seat. And then when it sees temperature and that alcohol water flashes, it expands and quite simply it just takes that plug and drives it onto the seat. So it, it normally closes and then it, norm and then it naturally reopens while this uh, alcohol and water condenses and pulls the plug off the seat. F and T traps, float and thermostatic trap. That's where the F and T comes from. They, they kind of have two principles. They have this uh, air side where they're using the thermostatic element, not unlike the radiator trap. It's normally open when steam is manufactured and it's coming down through the main and the air is being pushed in front of the steam. The air enters through this element, this thermostatic element that's normally open into the bypass and then into the return system out through the vents of the condensate pumps and boiler feed tanks. Once the steam arrives, gets very close, that element expands, the alcohol water flashes and reacts and closes that plug. Now, the steam is just sitting inside here and as condensate forms and drains into here, that float, like a ball cock, as that level rises, it's just pulling this ball up, pulling the plug off its seat, and draining the condensate now into the return line. 
So we get rid of the air through the thermostatic element. We get rid of the condensate through the float part of the element. Very different, very, very common uh, trap used in low pressure heating for ends of mains in heat exchanges. Those are two very popular uh, applications for a float and thermostatic trap. Um, just a couple of characteristics. It modulates because that float can modulate up and down, can handle heavy loads, light loads, and it can handle a lot of air. It can handle a lot of air, which is very good on a startup of a main where you want to have that balance and you want steam at the end of the main as fast as possible. Uh, and this would be a typical application located here at the end of the main. And his only job is to handle the condensate that is formed when you heat this pipe from you know, startup temperature, ambient temperature to steam temperature. His job is not to pass all of the radiation condensate that's handled by the individual traps. So end of main steam traps typically speak on a three quarter inch, one inch, no more than that. Quick application. So <clears throat> whenever you walk into a residential application and you've got steam, uh, a steam radiator, it's got a supply valve on one end, and then you have a steam trap on the other end, and you see this where someone uh, over the years has drilled and tapped and put a radiator vent, that's telling you a story. And what it's telling you is that this system has steam traps that have failed, most likely in the open position. And in doing so, what it does is it allows that steam to get past its point of use and into the returns where it wreaks holy havoc with a uh, putting pressure in a, in a return line that's supposed to be under no pressure and just uh, creating havoc. So here's a typical two pipe with that trap, uh, condensate pump, um, uh, and where you could have steam kind of blowing out that vent pipe because once it's in the returns, once it gets past these radiator traps because they have failed open, it, that steam is still just chasing that low pressure. And what's the, what's the low pressure uh, access? The vent pipe. So you can walk in the boiler room residential or commercial, and you can see steam coming out of a, a vent pipe. Here was a picture of a contractor texting me of a home in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Replaced the boiler, put in a feed tank, <clears throat> and um, on startup, they hadn't done some trap maintenance over the years, and all of a sudden it revealed you know, that they had to go back and place some cage units on some of the radiators because the steam was just blowing right through. I'm gonna see if I can play this real quickly for you guys. Uh, this was a, in a commercial, uh, apartment building in uh, Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, and the guy was having some problems with the uh, condensate pump. Any water coming out of there, this is pumping. Is it because it's too hot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vapor bound? Yeah, it's too hot. Yeah, it's too hot. Yeah, it's too hot. Oh, you've seen it firsthand. And here's just the follow-up picture. Video. It's still in the border with the live state. You see, the contractor is running by the condensate pump on the bottom here. Couldn't pump. They're not designed to pump uh, condensate. I mean, excuse me, they are designed to pump condensate, not steam. And the as that temperature gets extremely hot, the pump starts to cavitate. So what I'm trying to show here is this is a this is a typical solution we'll see in some of these commercial buildings where property management company doesn't want to spend any money, but wants that steam pouring out the vent pipe to go away. The plumber will come in and put in what we refer to as a master trap. And the master trap does a very good job of two things. One, it will do a good job of preventing the steam from now having access to that vent pipe because it'll stop right here. So there will be no more steam pouring out of the vent pipe. It also does a very good job of guaranteeing that from this point here, all the way back throughout the system, you're gonna pressurize it and you're gonna kill the differential, the pressure differential which causes steam to flow. It goes from a high to a low. If you don't have that low, the reason you don't have the low is because you've locked it in at steam pressure because the trap does his, does his job and stops the steam, you lose your distribution. And speaking of school boards, um, condo uh, trustee committees, places that have a lot of old steam systems, old steam traps, don't wanna spend the money to fix it, but they're having all kinds of problems. I usually sit down and would draw this little uh, ladder, picture of a ladder. That's a, that represents a two pipe steam system. One side of the ladder is our steam supply. 
the rungs are the radiators and the other side of the uh, ladder is your condensate return. And you just can't have steam get from the supply through the radiators into the return. Because once it does, now you've lost your differential. Now there's pressure here. So I have pressure and I have pressure and I got air that gets trapped. And that's why that guy showed up at that house years ago and drilled and tapped the radiator vent, thinking he's solving the problem. But, but he didn't, he didn't really solve it. He got the air out of the radiator, but the steam came up the back end of that radiator that I showed you, and it was causing condensate to spit out of the vent pipe, or the vent of the radiator. This was just a quick picture of a, a mechanical room at a, a high school, and um, here is a duplex, and when they say duplex on condensate, they're saying, okay, I got two pumps with some type of a mechanical alternator. But what I got a kick out of when I walked into the room is I have this vent pipe right here off of that receiver. Look what's connected to it. <clears throat> I got coat hangers where the facilities people would hang their jackets or their shirts, but typically jackets, and they were getting frustrated because they had steam coming out of the vent line and it was making their jackets dirty. So this was their solution. <laughs> they took a, uh, a commercial grade uh, water ho a garden hose and ran it up over, you know, all OSHA, all OSHA approved, I'm sure, over the drop lights and uh, out past the piping and out the um, window into the courtyard. <laughs> so no more steam on the guy's jackets. And then just think of all the, the expenses and damage all that makeup water is doing to that steam system. Uh, real quickly, we vapor vacuum systems, you'd come across these high-end residential homes that still see them today where they, they still exist. It's kind of a, a tribute to the engineering and manufacturing of stuff 100 years ago that's still out in the field. But they were you know, weird or freaky or funky devices. Their job was to help the condensate get back into a two-pipe steam system before condensate pumps had ever been built. That's when you're gonna see all of these weird devices is they're gonna be on a two-pipe steam system. Um, and those two-pipe steam systems would have radiators with radiator traps. I'm just going through them real quick because we're, we're kind of running out of time here. Uh, condensators, or boiler return traps, alternating receivers, you can look them up. They, they um, have all different names, but the same function was to help the condensate that's coming back. And real quickly, if you just think about it, if these traps are doing their job, and they would be, especially on day one, when they drain condensate from the ra uh, radiators into the dry return and more steam arrived, those traps would close. So the condensate in the air that's coming back is under no pressure by design. We don't want any pressure. We want it open to this large capacity air vent. So then the condensate <clears throat> that has no leftover pressure is now forced to try to get into this coal fired boiler that is under pressure. And if you look at this line right here, every pound of pressure in that boiler, I need water condensate to stack 30 inches. So if I had a coal-fired boiler that built itself up to two PSI, I'd need five feet and they'd have all kinds of problems. And that's why they developed these devices that would intercept that and, and create pressure back here, almost acting like a condensate pump and um, drive condensate back into the boiler. You see them all over the place. On the inside, this is what's going on. You're always gonna find an air line and a steam supply. And you're gonna have a two position valve and it's connected to, again, almost like a ball cock. And when the, when the float is down, the steam line is closed, the air vent is open. As the condensate starts to back up, why is it backing up? Because of the pressure in the boiler isn't allowing him to get into the boiler. That float rises, 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 and all of a sudden that two position valve occurs. Boom, this steam valve opens up, the air line closes, so we don't have any steam in the returns. And we just drive steam pressure in here and the leftover steam, the steam pressure, and this thing was always installed X number of inches above the height of the boiler, condensate would slide into the boiler. So piping, what else can cause some banging? Um, uh, bad piping technique uh, can cause uneven heat, it can cause no heat, and usually that source of piping comes from the boiler. And the boiler manufacturers are very specific today on how to pipe their replacement steam boilers relative to what might, you might find in the, uh, from the old guy that you're taking out. And the, the main thing of what I'm just showing you in these uh, two slides is the manufacturers uh, are, 
are not making a very uh, steam friendly. So they're really asking the near boiler piping to be a source of catching this excess water that is gonna be pulled out of the boiler through the risers, through the near boiler piping, and then thrown back down this, they call it an equalizer line. It's also acting as a drip to get any of that condensate that does get up into this header, get it right back to the boiler. <clears throat> and they would show different, you know, the manufacturers would show in their installation manuals, you know, suggestions on how to pipe, whether it be the riser over here, or the header over here, the drip or the equalizer, the Hartford loop, whether you use a close nipple or even a Y fitting. Uh, and then sometimes you come across jobs where the guy dis disregards that and all of a sudden he creates a situation where there's a lot of banging and it's simply because of the near boiler piping. And the manufacturers would typically say, hey, I got this A dimension. I want the, the height of the bottom of that header at least 24 to 28 inches off. And the reason for that is this, well, this guy disregarded it. But what's going on here is when you're first starting up that boiler, the piping's cold. The header starts to fill with condensate or this equalizer line. If that line is too low, like in this example here, that header starts to fill with condensate. And in doing so, what happens is internally, the diameter of this pipe has just been reduced, which means the velocity gets even faster and it pulls more water out of the boiler. If the boiler manufacturers look at my one riser is inadequate, I need you to use two risers, you don't want to do this. Put the takeoff, the system takeoff between those two risers. We want that down here between the last and the drip. And here's why. Of course, here's a couple of examples of some big, beautiful commercial boilers that are piped absolutely dead wrong, had to be repiped. Because this is again what's going to happen condensate's going to gather in between the two rises, it's going to reduce the diameter of the internals of this piping here, which affects the velocity and it puts the boiler into a priming condition. We want it at the end. So any of that condensate that is pulled out of the boiler, any of the condensate that's pulled out of the boiler, it's all heading in the right direction, down the drip, down the equalizer. Definitely whatever the manufacturer says for the, for the takeoff coming out of the boiler, don't do this, don't put a reducer. There's a reason why they're saying what size to use. <clears throat> um, one pipe radiators, you know, this could be the number one source. Again, it's, it's the whole thing about taking the boiler room blinders off, when you're upstairs looking at a one pipe radiator that's either banging and or spitting condensate, sometimes the source is this pipe down here, this elbow joint has sagged. And when it sags, it allows a pocket to develop. And as that wind comes across, that con the steam heading to that vent, it'll pull water with it. What's the water up there? <clears throat> um, you may want to check the hanging flat, man. Holy shit, it's like a tornado up there. So real quickly here, uh, just cleaning boilers. The, the point of all these little drawings here is you want to have a, a nice clean surface area across the entire uh, area of that boiler. And what's not uncommon is when they're building the boiler and they're using cutting oils and all of that, you can get some of that that seeps into the, into the boiler water. And that, boiler, that oil on the surface can create tension. When the boiler fires and is manufacturing steam, Steam's have a hard time trying to get through that oil. And then eventually it'll break through and it kind of will gather, it'll break through here. All that oil that was sitting here gets pushed over here, creates some resistance, the steam can't get through here. It builds up, builds up, and all of a sudden you've got this washing machine effect. And sometimes you might see it as a, a water moving in a gauge glass. If someone thinks, okay, I can get rid of that oil, I'll just drain the boiler from the base of the boiler. Well, all you're doing is allowing the oil to gather along all the nooks and crannies throughout the cast iron section. And as soon as you go and refill it, they're just gonna float back up and you back to your oil tension. Really the, be the best way is to skim it. And most manufacturers, if not all, will provide this skim, this thing called a skim port, where they want you to build a skim station so you can raise the water line up a little bit and skim slowly as you're bringing in makeup water, you're skimming out the oil all out of the boiler. And depending upon the job, it can take a long time, but there's no, there's no real easy way around that. <clears throat> what I just want to show you, one last thing, one last subject to talk about is condensate pumps. Can new boilers work with condensate pumps? 
And in a condensate pump, real quick picture, gravity lines draining back to this vessel, open vent to the atmosphere, got a, usually a squiddy switch, float rises, electricity is provided to the pump, pump turns on, unloads the receiver, dumps the water back into the boiler, water line drops, float drops, switch opens. Simple, easy. I got it, you get it. <clears throat> and you see these all over various basements, especially older two-pipe steam systems where they'll have a condensate pump with a pretty good sized big boiler. Uh, but what happens is now this boiler fails and I got to put in a replacement boiler that's physically going to be much smaller, even if it can manufacture the same BTUs. And the question becomes, can this condensate pump work friendly enough with the small boiler? And a lot of times the answer is no. And, and what happens is we start uh, replacing that condensate unit with a boiler feed tank. And you'll notice the boiler feed tank doesn't have a square D switch. The boiler will now have a pump controller that's monitoring the boiler's water line, has a float inside here with some switches. And one of those switches is wired back to the boiler feed unit. And his job is to monitor the boiler's water line and turn this pump on and off to keep this boiler running, keep it manufacturing steam as long as there's a call for heat. Whatever uh, fluctuations take place in the system and in the receiver, uh, the boiler feed unit, as long as it's sized properly, can, ex can absorb that so that we don't have any water spitting out over the, over the floor here. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, that's the difference and that's where you'll see a lot of replacement steam boilers are going to need a boiler feed unit and a pump controller. And that's a quick picture of one where they're piping in on, a on an equalizing column with some piping crosses a 150 pump controller, McDonnell Miller 150 pump controller, that's gonna control the operation of the feed pump based on the needs of the water level of the boiler. Just be careful of not creating a water leg. If you notice the receivers of the boiler feed are much larger because they act like a reservoir of, of maintaining or holding the water that is needed that the old boiler had and the new boiler doesn't. And if you just take this return line that used to drop into a small receiver, a lot of condensate unit, and you raise it up and dump it into the higher unit, you just created a water seal, water like all the way across the basement. You created no heat. This is an example right here. A guy pipes it in, rises, raises it up. You're going to create a water seal all the way across that basement. I'm going to go past this. One thing to be aware of, closed motorized valves. When you have motorized valves and they close, what can happen here is the residual steam right in that boiler, it, it, the burner shuts off saying, okay, I don't have a call for heat. The leftover steam condenses. Well, what happens? I uh, shrink in volume 1,700 times. I'm creating this void, this vacuum. And the thing in this application here, what they're pointing out is the only thing I'm connected to is this boiler feed tank that's open, open to the atmosphere. And so atmospheric pressure now becomes my high pressure. So high pressure is pushing water through the check valve and into this boiler chasing that vacuum, that low pressure. So the pump is not on. You're watching the gauge glass rise up with water. You'll actually flood the boiler depending on how deep a vacuum you can develop. So a quick uh, way of solving that is uh, a vacuum breaker like we talked about earlier. And this was an example of a residential home that had these zone valves up above and they were continually having problems with a boiler going under vacuum. So just a couple things, you know, what happens when a boiler is too small? Um, a lot of times the boiler is never going to cycle on its pressure troll. The pressure gauge never moves. The water line doesn't move. There's going to be a complaint of parts of the building heat okay. Other parts just, I just can never seem to get heat. That would be, uh, one of the common complaints would be, because I'm not manufacturing enough steam to fill this big metal balloon before uh, the, you know, the, either before the boiler shuts down because part of the house is already satisfied from the thermostat. Uh, so it's very critical that you size a boiler properly to the connected load inside that building, be it a, uh, an apartment building or a, a residential home. But a symptom would be, hey, I can't get heat to a couple of radiators. You, you go there and you monitor and you're like, geez, the gauge never moves. I can't build any pressure because everything I'm manufacturing is condensing. And the water line, not that we want it to move a lot, but it, it doesn't move at all. Like it's just simmering or percolating. Uh, if you take the insulation off, what can happen? Uh, it's not uncommon to get rid of the asbestos over the years, but they definitely encourage re-insulating with a, you know, an, an 
uh, an acceptable uh, uh, replacement insulation because when you take it off, you just added a bunch of radiators to that boiler, which could in effect have the boiler act as if it's too small now. All of a sudden you've added this additional load. And what happens when the boiler is too big? Um, that typically will lead to a lot of short cycling. Uh, you probably still get heat, but you'll get a tremendous amount of cycling because you're actually shoving 10 pounds into a five pound bag. Uh, one last thing, what happens when a radiator breathes? And what we're referring to that is you get a stubborn radiator that just doesn't seem to heat. And you're to the point where you get the boiler running and you're making steam and other parts of the house are heating okay. And you very carefully with a pair of gloves or a wrench and you back the radiator vent right off, um, right off its uh, tapping, eighth inch tapping. And you put a match right next to the hole, the, the, uh, the orifice, the, the tapping. And you can actually see, and I've seen it you know, dozens of times over the years, where as the, as the steam is, is heading towards that vent, that opening now, uh, the, the, the flame will get pushed you know, as if it was venting air. And then all of a sudden, within a second or two, the flame gets pulled right back into the radiator or the, or the flame is snuffed out and the residual smoke gets pulled into the radiator. And it goes back and forth. And what that's letting you know is probably at the base of that takeoff, there is a pocket of water. And as the steam runs over it, uh, there's the push, and then the water seals the latent heat and the steam collapses. And there's the suck, and that's where it's pulling that vent right back in. Uh, the air, uh, uh, excuse me, the smoke from the, um, uh, the cigarette or the, or the match back in to the radiator. And it will just do this throughout the whole cycle. And the answer again is not fixing something at the radiator. It's usually the piping downstairs needs to, it probably got dislodged and it formed this pocket of water. So <clears throat> Q and A, I know I've, I, I know I've gone past the limit and I apologize. And I thank, you thank everybody uh, for kind of hanging in there. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm not sure how many questions we had. I'm gonna unmute.